Good morning and welcome. These are the readings and sermon for Sunday, November 7th, All Saints Sunday. So let us begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. A reading from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our psalm this morning is a reading of Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell therein. For the Lord has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in God's holy place? Those of innocent hands and purity of heart who do not swear on God's being, nor do they pledge by what is false. They shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek you, O Lord, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Truly the Lord of hosts is the King of glory. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, a reading from Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, <clears throat> For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 11, verses 32 through 44. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. 
So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So, he, so they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Visions and hopes. Life is well nigh impossible to live without visions and hopes. Visions and hopes makes all the difference in our personal lives as well as in the life of the church and the history of the world. Centuries ago, the Spanish fleet had the following inscription on their flags, non plus ultra, meaning nothing more beyond. But then Columbus discovered America and they had to remove the non from their flags. Then the flags read plus ultra, meaning more beyond. In our first and second lessons today, we are given two very similar parallel visions filled with hopes for a better redemptive future. They are visions and hopes of God's plus ultra, more beyond. Both of these passages were likely written out of a context of persecution and exile. In our first reading from the prophet Isaiah, he offers his people who were likely languishing in Babylonian exile, a word of future vision and hope. They had lost or were in grave danger of losing their nation, along with their religious, social, economic, political, and cultural roots. The oppressive life of exile was wearing them down to the depths of despair. Where was their God who had made an eternal covenant with them? Had God abandoned them now forever? If so, what were they to do? How were they to live? Was there any vision or hope left among them? Out of this context, a prophet appears among them to share this encouraging vision and hope with them. He assures them that there is indeed a redemptive, liberating future coming. Isaiah's word of vision and future hope takes shape as a feast of rich food and well-aged wines involving all peoples on the mountain of the Lord, that is, at Jerusalem, the holy city. Along with this banquet feast of all nations, God promises to destroy the shroud, the sheet of death. Death shall be swallowed up forever. Along with this, there will be only joy and celebration since God promises to wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. The prophet's message ends with an invitation to his people. The invitation is one of encouragement, joy, and celebration. Let us be glad and rejoice in God's salvation. The vision and future hope of St. John, the writer of our second lesson, is a similar one. It too likely comes out of a context of suffering, persecution, and exile. Tradition has it that John wrote this book of Revelation while in exile on the island of Patmos. He, like the prophet Isaiah in our first lesson, wishes to communicate a message of encouragement, vision, and future hope to his people who are suffering under the persecution of the Roman Empire. When one reads or hears his words, 
One is given the impression of sheer awe, wonder, and joy at what God is doing to save his people. John tells us that he sees a new heaven and a new earth along with the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice, though, that all of this newness is not a continuation of the old. Rather, it is totally new because everything old has passed away. This new Jerusalem is described in the love language of a marriage. The marriage now is an eternal one. It's a marriage between God the groom and the new Jerusalem the bride, wherein God's people from all nations shall gather and dwell. Once again, we are given a similar parallel message as in our first lesson, when the writer goes on to describe God's saving activity, saying, And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. This vision and future hope is, once again, a message of encouragement, of celebration, and joy. Today, as we gather here, maybe some of us or even all of us are feeling a little like those ancient Israelites in exile and those early Christians facing persecution. It's not easy to be a faithful Christian in the midst of the secular society we live in. Maybe we too are feeling threatened in some way or other. Maybe we're struggling with our own or a loved one's sufferings and doubts. Maybe we've lost our job or health or a friend or a loved one. Maybe we feel so alone and forgotten that it's extremely difficult for us to live with any hope. Maybe we're confused about how our life is unfolding and lack a clear sense of vision concerning our future. Maybe we're struggling with God and wonder where God is or what God is doing in our lives. Then there are the larger concerns and issues of our church, our nation, and every nation. How can we live meaningful lives? Can we really live with a sense of vision and hope for our personal lives, our church, and our world right now and in the future? Our first and second lessons today give us words of encouragement, vision, and hope. They are words from God to us. They provide us with an alternative way to live. Instead of doubt, despair, apathy, fear, and resignation, our lessons instruct us to celebrate life, to live with vision, hope, and joy, to share God's good news of love and salvation with others. In the midst of all the troubles and complexities of our world, take heart. Don't give up. God is still in control. God is working in us and others to make God's new heaven and earth and the new Jerusalem. But the greatest vision of hope for the future is the promise of the resurrection. The good news is that just as Jesus promised Mary that her brother would live again and then raise Lazarus from death, so Jesus promises all who believe in him that one day we too shall be raised to everlasting life. Death will be no more because Jesus defeated it through the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb. And we shall dwell with our Lord in the new Jerusalem, and Jesus, Jesus will be the one going around with the handkerchief to wipe away every tear. On this All Saints Sunday, we remember and honor all the faithful departed who have gone on ahead of us to their eternal reward. We remember them and look to them because they lived in very profound ways the visions and hopes of our first and second lessons today. We remember them and look to them because they inspire us with the lives that they lived, lives of holy meaning and purpose. The following story, credited to Nathaniel Hawthorne, is about one such ordinary everyday saint. 
In a pleasant sunny valley surrounded by lofty mountains lived a boy named Ernest. On the side of one of the mountains in bold relief, nature had carved the features of a gigantic face. From the steps of his cottage, the boy used to gaze intently upon the stone face for his mother had told him that someday a man would come to the valley that would look just like the great stone face. His coming would bring joy and happiness to the entire community. Mother, said the boy, I wish that it could speak, for it looks so kind that its voice must be pleasant. Why, if I were to see such a man with such a face, I should love him dearly. So Ernest continued to gaze at the great stone face for hours at a time. Several times the rumor spread that the long-awaited benefactor was coming, but each time when the man arrived, the rumor proved to be false. In the meantime, Ernest had grown into manhood, doing good wherever he could. The people in the village loved him, and everyone was his friend. As he became an old man, Ernest was still looking for the arrival of the long-expected man. One day, a poet came into the valley. He had heard the prophecy about the great stone face, and at evening, when the sun was setting, he saw Ernest talking to some people. As the last rays of light flooded the massive outlines on the distant mountainside, they fell on Ernest's face. The poet cried aloud, Behold, behold, Ernest himself is the likeness of the great stone face. Then all the people looked, and sure enough, they saw what the poet said was true. By looking daily at the great stone face, Ernest had become just like it. My friends, as we remember and honor, as we are inspired by all the saints today, we too can become like them, provided we keep our lives in proper focus. Like the saints who have gone on before us, we need to keep our eyes and our lives focused on messages like our first and second lessons today. For it is God's word, not that of the world, that has the power to give us vision and hope. It is God's word that offers us the promise of a new heaven and earth, a new Jerusalem, an eternal redemption and salvation. If we keep our lives focused on these visions and hopes, we too shall reflect their reality in our lives to the world, just as Ernest did in the story. May God help us to live out the reality of these visions and hopes in our lives so that we, together with all the saints, shall celebrate the feast of our Messiah, which has no end, and be able to sing together that wonderful hymn, Jerusalem, my happy home, when shall I come to thee? When shall my sorrow have an end? Thy joys, when shall I see? O happy harbor of the saints, O sweet and pleasant soil, in thee no sorrow may be found, no grief, no care, no toil. Amen. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forevermore. Amen.